January is here. Happy New Year. Winter is here. And along with it comes long, cold nights with lots of great objects for us to enjoy and explore. In this episode, we'll explore the planets and let you know how to see them. We'll go over a meteor shower and explore some of the best deep sky objects visible on January evenings. If you're watching on YouTube, please like and smash that subscribe button. And if you're listening on audio, please leave us a nice review on your podcast platform. We really appreciate that. We really love getting questions, suggestions, comments, and reviews from you. If you ever have questions or comments, you can also leave them at astroguypodcast at gmail.com, or you can leave us a voicemail at 973-404-0380. You heard me talk about the contest. We're going to be holding a contest, giving away an image that I took printed on a metal print uh, of the North American Nebula. And we're going to do that once we hit 1,000 subscribers on YouTube. So please hit the subscribe button if you haven't. And please tell your friends to check us out and subscribe. Uh, stay tuned for more info on the contest. If you'd like to help support the Astro Guy podcast and YouTube channel, you can buy us a cup of coffee. The money is used to maintain and update the equipment that we use to create and publish the show. The link is in the show notes. Thank you. Okay. Let's get to the January skies. Welcome to the Astro Guy podcast. I'm not an expert. I'm an amateur like you. I'm here to learn and here to teach. So let's enjoy the ride together. Carpe Noctum, seize the night. Welcome to the Astro Guy podcast. I'm your host, Wayne Zool. January begins with the moon at Apogee, its furthest point in its orbit from the Earth. When this happens, the moon appears at its smallest diameter, in this case, about 29 and a half arc minutes across. At its largest, which is often referred to as a supermoon, it appears about 33 and a half arc minutes in size. However, visually, it's hard to tell the difference. On January 3rd, the Earth will be at perihelion, its closest point in its orbit around the Sun. Mercury is visible in the morning sky at the start of January, where it will be low on the eastern horizon. As the twilight glow begins to appear, Mercury will be about 5 degrees above the horizon. Mercury is bright at magnitude minus 0 0.13, and if your horizon permits, you should be able to spot it fairly easily. In a telescope, it will appear as a slightly gibbous glow about seven arc seconds across. On the morning of the 9th, the very thin waning crescent moon will be about nine degrees southwest of Mercury. Binoculars will definitely help you spot the thin crescent moon. Venus will form a right triangle with the moon and Mercury that morning. On the morning of the 27th, you might be able to spot Mercury only a quarter of a degree away from Mars, just above the eastern horizon. You'll need an excellent horizon and binoculars to pick the pair out of the twilight glow. While Mercury will be visible all month long in the morning sky, it will be very low on the horizon. Venus is still ruling the morning skies in January, but it's beginning to appear lower on the horizon each morning. On the 1st, Venus shines at magnitude minus 4, and at 6.30 a.m. it appears about 18 degrees above the horizon. The planet shows a 78% illuminated gibbous phase and spans about 14 arc seconds in diameter. By the end of the month, Venus will have dimmed slightly to magnitude minus 3.9 and will appear to have shrunk to about 12 and a half arc seconds across and will appear about 85% illuminated. During February and March, Venus will continue to appear to descend toward the horizon as it nears the sun from our perspective. It will reappear in the evening skies in the fall, so now is the time to catch it before it disappears in the glow of the sun. On the morning of January 8th, the 11% illuminated crescent moon will appear about 8 degrees southwest of Venus. Binoculars will help you spot the red star Antares about 1.5 degrees east of the moon that morning. This should make for a gorgeous sight. Mars is lost in the glow of the sun all month, and won't become easily visible until March. The gas giants are all still visible on January evenings, 
at least for part of the evening. Jupiter is high in the southeast at the start of the month, shining at magnitude minus 2.58, with the planet's disk spanning almost 44 arc seconds in diameter. Jupiter transits the meridian just before 7.30 p.m. and sets a little after 2 a.m. By the end of the month, Jupiter will have faded to magnitude minus 2.35, with the disk of the planet spanning just under 40 arc seconds. On the 31st, Jupiter transits at 5.36 p.m. and sets at 24 minutes after midnight. As you can see, each day Jupiter sets earlier and appears slightly dimmer and smaller. The largest planet in our solar system will continue to grace the evening skies through this winter, but it is starting to fade. So get your Jupiter observations in while you still can. On the evening of the 18th, the 56% illuminated moon will be 3 degrees north of Jupiter. This should be stunning to see. At the beginning of January, Saturn will be low in the southwest at sunset and will be visible for a couple of hours before setting a little before 9 p.m. Saturn will be shining at magnitude 0.96 and the disk of the planet spans 16 arc seconds, but with the rings, it appears to be about 37 arc seconds wide. As the month goes on, Saturn sets earlier each night, and by the end of January, it sets at 7.15 p.m. So if you want to catch it, do it soon, as it too will be lost in the glow of the sun until it reemerges in the morning skies in April. On the evening of January 14th, the 16% illuminated waxing crescent moon Will be seven degrees east of Saturn. This is going to be a beautiful sight. Uranus is conveniently placed in Aries and can easily be found between Jupiter and the Pleiades all month long. Uranus can be seen with the naked eye under very dark skies, but it's easily spotted with binoculars even from light polluted skies. Uranus appears small, spanning a little more than three and a half arc seconds in diameter and it glows at magnitude 5.7. It will fade slightly as the month goes on, but it really won't be noticeable visually. On the 19th, you can glimpse the 70% illuminated waxing gibbous moon four degrees north of Uranus. Neptune begins January high in the south-southeastern sky as the sun sets. It's in the constellation Pisces, and it is faint at magnitude 7.8. You'll need binoculars or a telescope to spot this distant world. The bluish disk of the planet only spans about two arc seconds across, so you'll need steady seeing and higher magnification to see it as anything more than a bluish star. At the start of January, Neptune sets at 10.48 p.m., but by the end of the month, it sets before 9 p.m. Next month, Neptune will get lost in the glow of the sun, so now's your chance to catch it in the evening skies until much later in the year. The moon makes appearances near the planet most months, but our moon also appears near other objects as well. On January 20th, the moon will be 5 degrees east of M45, the Pleiades star cluster. On the evening of the 22nd, the moon will be 3.5 degrees north of the open cluster M35. See our December 2023 episode to learn about M35 and how to find it. On the 25th, the nearly full moon will be 4 degrees southeast of the Beehive Cluster, M44. The moon is bright, but with a telescope or binoculars, you can spot these objects near the moon. On the morning of January 8th, for observers in the western part of the United States, if the weather cooperates, you might be able to witness the moon passing in front of the bright star Antares. The occultation begins at 5.35 a.m. West Coast time. On January 4th, the annual Quadrantids meteor shower will peak. The best chances of catching any meteors will be before the moon rises around midnight. This isn't the best year for the Quadrantids, but with luck, you might catch a few. All right, that was a lot for the solar system this month. Let's do something a little bit different and take a look at some of the best double stars that can be observed on January evenings. Double stars and multiple stars are fun objects. They have the advantage of not being impacted as much as, say, nebulae due to light pollution. Additionally, many double and multiple stars can be seen with just binoculars or a small telescope. Large aperture and dark skies aren't as necessary with stars compared with extended deep sky objects. So let's explore some of the best together. 
We'll begin our tour in the western skies with a double star that is best seen during the summer months, but it's still easy to spot in the west just after darkness falls. However, it sets a couple hours after sunset, so you'll want to catch it early. Let's explore Beta Cygni, which is commonly referred to as Albireo. Locating Albireo is easy, as it's the star marking the head of the swan in Cygnus. It can also be spotted as the bottom star in the Northern Cross asterism. Albireo glows at magnitude 3.35, and in a telescope, shows two gorgeous components, one blue and the other gold. The two components are separated by about one arc minute, making them easy to split in a telescope or in most binoculars. The pair is about 420 light years away from us. This is one of the most striking double stars in the entire night sky. It is my personal favorite double star, and it should make your list as well. Plus, it's a great warm-up for the other objects we'll dive into this month. The rest of the stars that we'll explore this month are all located in and around the winter hexagon asterism that we explored in our March 2022 episode. I've left a link to that in the show notes as well if you need a refresher. As the evening progresses on, all of these stars will become visible. Let's move to the constellation Auriga, the charioteer, and we'll look for a star 12 degrees southeast of Capella. This is the bright double star Theta Aurigae. Its proper name is Mahasam. You'll need to crank up the magnification to show the companion, as it's only about four arc seconds from the primary star. The primary star shines brightly at magnitude 2.65, while the secondary star is fainter at magnitude 7.2. The system is approximately 165 light years away from us. Both stars are white in color, but with good seeing and high magnification, you should be able to spot the companion. While it can be a bit of a challenge to see it, it can be spotted with a six inch or larger scope quite easily. A bit easier to split is the multiple star system Castor and the constellation Gemini, the twins. Castor is the northernmost of the two stars marking the head of the twins, with Pollux being the other. Castor appears as a triple star, but it's actually three pairs of double stars that are gravitationally bound to each other. While there are six stars in the system, only the three brightest components are viewable. The other components are spectroscopic binaries, only detectable by viewing the changing spectrum of the stars, as the companion stars are faint brown dwarfs. Castor glows brightly at magnitude 1.6. Component A is listed at magnitude 1.3, while component B is listed at magnitude 2.97, Component C is magnitude 9.9, .9, which can be challenging to spot. However, A and B are pretty easy to see. The distance from A to C is 72 arc seconds, while caster A and B appear about 6 arc seconds apart. This system is located a mere 51 light years away from us. The brightest star in the night sky, Sirius in Canis Major, is also a double star. However, it can be a bit of a challenge to split as its companion star is pretty faint. Sirius is one of the closest stars to us at a distance of only 8.6 light years. Sirius A is known as the dog star and its companion Sirius B is called the pup. While Sirius A shines brilliantly at magnitude minus 1.46, the pup glows dimly at magnitude 8.44, making Sirius A appear about 25,000 times brighter than the pup. This is where the difficulty in spotting it comes. Fortunately for us, the pair are currently at their furthest apart in their 50-year orbit. So the pup is about 11 arc seconds away from Sirius A. You can split the pair with binoculars, but it's very difficult to do. A telescope will make the task a lot easier. Moving Sirius A just out of the field may help you spot the pup. It's definitely worth a try, as it's fun and it's practically a neighbor as far as stars go. Canis Major has other fun double stars to see. New Canis Majoris is located three degrees southwest of Sirius. This system glows with a combined magnitude of 5.7, about the same brightness as the planet Uranus. The brighter star appears yellowish, and the fainter companion is white, glowing at magnitude 7.4. The two stars appear separated by about 17 arc seconds, 
making them easy to spot in almost any telescope. Taurus is famous for its large star clusters like the Hyades and the Pleiades, but it's also home to some fun doubles. Let's take a look at Struve 559, which is easy to locate between Aldebaran and Ain, or Epsilon Tauri. Blowing at magnitude 6.9, you can spot the pair in binoculars, but it's going to be hard to split it. While not very bright, both components are seventh magnitude and are separated by only three arc seconds. So this one will hold up well to higher magnifications. Our last object on this month's tour is the beautiful star that marks the foot of Orion the Hunter. Listed at magnitude 0.15, Rigel is actually a triple star system. Rigel A is a blue supergiant that glows at magnitude 0.15 while its two companions, B and C, are listed at a combined magnitude of 6.8 and are separated from A by approximately 9 arc seconds, making the pair easy to split in most telescopes. B and C orbit about each other, and the pair orbits around Rigel A. B and C take 67 years to complete one orbit around each other, while the BC system takes 24,000 years to complete one orbit around Rigel A. I do hope that you'll go after these objects and that they become favorites of yours as well. Well, that's all for this month. Thank you so much for tuning in, and I hope that you found our time together to be fun and helpful. If you have questions or episode suggestions, please email us at astroguypodcast at gmail.com or leave us a text or a voicemail at 973-404-0380. If you're not already a member, please join the Astro Guy podcast group on Facebook. You'll find other members, videos, blogs, and lots of other useful information there for your enjoyment. You can also visit our YouTube channel, the Astro Guy podcast, for past episodes and other surprises. Please subscribe. Please consider leaving us a review on your podcast platform. It helps us to get new listeners. Thank you again for listening, and may your skies be clear. As always, Carpe Noctum, seize the night. I'm Wayne Zool, and this was the Astro Guy Podcast. Thank you for listening. As always, your questions, comments, and suggestions are welcome. Keep wondering. Keep your eyes on the sky. Have fun. Carpe Noctum. Seize the night.